Good evening. Uh, today, um, at the request of so many of our students who wanted Darrow Yannett diagram, and so I'm going to take that as the uh, demo class today uh, for the next half an hour. And if um, uh, let me introduce myself before we carry on. I am uh, Dr. Arupama Chaudhary Devgan. I have uh, I've been an, a physiology teacher with DAMS for the last 16 years. And um, so today we'll take up an interesting concept, which is called the darrow yannett diagram. And this is what we're going to discuss in detail. And um, so let's see this. Now, as far as the darrow yannett diagram is concerned, now firstly, let's have a look at the distribution of the total body water. Yes, let's have a look at distribution of total body water. And when you see the total body water, when we calculate total body water as a percentage of body weight, this is 60% of the body weight. Yes, the total body water is 60% of the body weight. So if you have a very simple kind of a question which has been asked in uh, the NEAT exam, and that is uh, the if there is a 70 kg man, how much is the total body water? In a 70 kg man, how much is the total body water? And like I said, it is 60% of the body weight. So it's 60 into 70. So it is going to be 42 kgs. Or you can also write it as 42 liters. Because when you talk of water, you know that one kg of water is equal to one liter of water. So we can write this as 42 kgs or 42 liters. So this is the total body water. Now the total body water is distributed in two compartments and the two thirds of the total body water is in the ICF. ICF is two thirds of the total body water and ECF is one third of the total body water. Yes, ECF is one third of the total body water. In terms of percentages of body weight, we can comfortably say the ICF is 40% of the body weight. 40% of the body weight. So that means if there is a 70 kg man, this will be 40% of 70, so approximately 28 liters. ICF is one third or 20% of the body weight. Yes, 20% of the body weight, right? So this is the... Um, uh, uh, in a 70 kg man, this would be approximately uh, 14 liters. Now, when you look at the ECF, ECF is further subdivided into interstitial fluid and plasma. Interstitial fluid is actually three fourths or 75% of the ECF and plasma is just one fourth or 25% of the ECF. In terms of percentages of body weight, the interstitial fluid, interstitial fluid is 15% of the body weight and the plasma the plasma is 5% um, of the body weight. Yes, 5% of the body weight. Now, please understand, you've also been asked questions like this. You have been asked a question that's 75% of the ECF is which compartment? Yes, 75% of the ECF, three fourths of the ECF is in the interstitial fluid and one fourth or 25% of the ECF is in is plasma. Right? In terms of percentages of body weight, the interstitial fluid is 15% of body weight and plasma is 5% of the body weight. Yes, 5% of the body weight. So this is the distribution of total body water. Right? You've also been asked a question, two thirds of total body water is in which compartment? Answer is ICF. One third in ECF and ECF is further subdivided into two compartments. Interstitial fluid, which is 75% of ECF or three fourths of ECF. In terms of percentages of body weight, 15% and plasma is 5%. There is yet another compartment which is of the ECF, which is called transcellular fluids. Now, what are these transcellular fluids? Now, transcellular fluids are, they are a part of ECF, but they are, they are contained in their own space. Transcellular fluids are present in their own space and these transcellular fluids are less than 1% of the body weight. Minuscule, right? Not too much. Just about 1 litre. Just about 1 litre in total. So this is just less than 1 to 1.5% of the body weight, right? Less than 1 kg or 1 litre in a 70 kg man. Now what are these transcellular fluids? Like I said, they're part of ECF but contained in their own spaces. For example, you have the pleural fluid. Pleural fluid is present in the pleural space or the pericardial fluid, which is present in the pericardial space or the joint fluid or the uh, aqueous humor. These are all examples of uh, peritoneal fluid. These are all examples of transcellular fluids. They're part of ECF, but contained in their own space. 
uh, why have I not included this in the, uh, if you look at this diagram, I've not mentioned transcellular fluids anywhere. The reason is transcellular fluids are theoretically a part of ECF, but when you're measuring the total body water, you can only measure, or when you're measuring the ECF, you can only measure the interstitial fluid and the plasma. You cannot measure the transcellular fluids because these transcellular fluids are all present in their own space. Right? So this is as far as your uh, the distribution of total body water is concerned. Now, uh, uh, extremely important, extremely important uh, is this next slide that what is the difference between the ECF and the ICF? Now, the first important point is that both of these have the same osmolality. ECF has an osmolality of 280 to 290 milliosmoles per liter. If you have to take a single volume, a single value, this is 290. ICF also has an osmolality of 290 milliosmoles per liter, right? Now, when I look at the different ions, both, uh, like I said, both ECF and ICF have the same osmolality, and that's very important because if there is a difference in osmolality, there is going to be movement of water, right? So here is ECF and ICF, which have the same osmolality, so that there is no shift of water between the two compartments. Right, so equal osmolality on both sides, but the uh, the substances and the ions contributing to osmolality in the ECF are different from that in the ICF. Now, which is the most osmotically active particle in the ECF? The most osmotically active particle in the ECF is in fact sodium. Sodium is the most osmotically active in the ECF. But which is most osmotically active in the ICF, that is potassium, right? So potassium is most osmotically active. This is going to be most osmotically active in the ICF, yes? So the diff though the osmolality is the same with both the ECF and the ICF, but substances which are contributing to osmolality are going to be different. The most osmotically active particle in the ECF is sodium, whereas the most osmotically active particle in the ICF is potassium, right? Now, if you look at these different ions, calcium is higher in the ECF, chloride higher in the ECF, bicarbonates higher in the ECF, magnesium higher in the ICF, phosphates higher in the ICF, proteins higher in the ICF, right? So these are extremely important points, which are the ones which are higher in the ECF? That is going to be sodium, calcium, chloride and bicarbonate. Sodium, calcium, chloride, and bicarbonate. What is higher in the ICF? This is going to be potassium, magnesium, phosphates, and proteins. Right? Phosphates and proteins. Right? What is higher in the ECF? Like I said, it's going to be sodium, calcium, chloride and bicarbonate. Now, when I look at, so these are higher in the ECF, potassium, magnesium, phosphates and proteins are higher in the ICF. Yes. If you look at the pH, pH is higher in the ECF. ICF pH is slightly lower, 7, 7 to 7.1. 7 to 7.1. That is the ECF, that is the pH in the ICF. Higher pH in the ECF. Proteins, like I said, higher in the ICF. So based on this, you had a very interesting question which was asked in Jitmer, which of the following is higher in, which of the following is higher in the ECF? Yes, which of the, this was a Jitmer question which was asked, which of the following is going to be higher in the ECF? A was osmolality, this is equal on both sides. Phosphates, phosphates higher in the ICF. C, proteins higher in the ICF. D, pH. pH is higher in the ECF. So this was a very interesting Jipmer question which was asked based on this. But the important point here is that the osmolality on both sides is, is the same. And that's very important because that means there is going to be no shift of water in normal circumstances. Because the, see, because we, you know this, isn't it? That water always moves from dilute to a concentrated solution, from an area of lower osmolality to an area of higher osmolality. Now, the next thing which I'm going to do with you is something called the Darrow-Yanet diagram. Now, what is this Darrow-Yanet diagram, sometimes also called the DY diagram? DY diagram, yes? Now, when I look at the DY diagram, this is basically going to tell you what will happen if there is addition of fluid into the body or if there is loss of fluid, 
Yes. So this diagram will help you to explain that. And if you look at this diagram, this is representing total body water. This rectangle here is representing the total body water. Volume is represented horizontally, concentration of solute or the osmolality. Concentration of solute or you can write also write it as osmolality is represented vertically. Yes. And if you see this, two thirds of the total body water, the large rectangle is the total body water. Two thirds of the total body water is in the ICF. One third is in the ECF and osmolality or the concentration of solute is the same on both sides. So the height of these two rectangles is the same. If you look at horizontally, two thirds is like I said, is, volume is represented horizontally. So two thirds in the ICF and ECF height of the rectangle is the concentration of solutes or the osmolality. This is the same on both sides. So the height of both the, tri the, both the rectangles is the same. So this is representing the total body water. Right now, what happens when there is addition or loss of fluid? What will happen to ECF? What will happen to ICF? Now, before we go on, what what uh, happens? What are the changes that we expect in the ICF and ECF? You have to keep three basic principles in mind. And what are these three basic principles? Number one, addition or loss of fluid, addition or loss of fluid. addition or loss of fluid is from is from the ecf whenever there is whenever you add fluid or if there is loss of fluid from the body it will be first from the ecf addition or loss of fluid is from the ecf number 2 ecf osmolality ecf osmolality determines the shift of fluid determines the shift of water determines shift of fluid Right? ECF osmolality. So if ECF osmolality is lower than the ICF, then water will shift from ECF to ICF. Have you understood? Right? Uh, remember, water always moves from dilute to concentrated. So lower osmolality means it's a lower concentration of solutes means it's a dilute solution. So water will move. So if ECF osmolality is lower, water will move from ECF to ICF. If ECF osmolality is higher, Concentration of solutes is more in the uh, ECF, then water will move from ICF to ECF, right? So ECF osmolality will determine the shift of fluid. And number three is the shift of fluid will occur. Shift of fluid occurs till shift of fluid occurs till ECF and ICF osmolality, till ECF and ICF osmolality is the same right till the ecf and the icf osmolality is the same this shift of fluid will occur till the ecf and the icf osmolality is the same right so addition or loss of fluid will always be from the ecf ecf osmolality determines the shift of fluid whether the shift of fluid is from ecf to icf or icf to ecf and shift of fluid will occur till the osmolality on both sides is the same till the ecf and the icf osmolality is the same so keep these three basic principles in mind that it becomes very easy for us to understand what happens if there is a addition of fluid or loss of fluid from the body. Now let's see the next one. Next is let's say if there is addition of isoosmotic or isotonic fluids. Isoosmotic or isotonic fluid like for, for example normal saline 0.9% saline isn't it that is isotonic or isoosmotic right. In other words this is also called isoosmotic volume expansion. Yes, addition of isotonic or isoosmotic fluids. That means the concentration of solutes in this fluid is the same as the osmolality of ECF and ICF. Now, remember the principles. I said the first one is addition or loss of fluid was always from the ECF. So when you add fluid to the body, it will first go into the ECF. Yes. For example, let's say you've added uh, 500 ml of normal saline. So it will go into the ECF. So ECF volume and therefore the total body water will increase. Yes. ECF volume and therefore the total body water will increase. Yes. No change in osmolality. So this is going to be these dashed lines which I am represent, which I am drawing. This will tell you that this is the total body water with increase in ECF volume, 
No change in ICF volume, but ECF osmolality and ICF osmolality is the same. Because like I said, it is addition of isoosmotic fluid or isotonic fluid. So net result will be increase in total body water. There is increase in the ECF volume. ECF osmolality is unchanged. It is same because obviously you have added isotonic fluid. So there's going to be no change in ECF osmolality. What about ICF volume and osmolality? ICF volume, ICF osmolality, both of these will remain the same. Both of these will remain the same. This is when you add isoosmotic fluid, like for instance, normal saline. I've understood my point, right? This is your isoosmotic fluid, right? That is, uh, like I said, the you when you add fluid, it first goes into the ECF compartment. So ECF expansion will occur. There is isoosmotic volume expansion. ECF osmolality is unchanged, so there is no shift of water, right? So there is increase in total body water. There is increase in ECF volume. ECF osmolality is going to be the same. ICF volume and osmolality also remains unchanged. Right? So this is the addition of isoosmotic fluid. Right? Now let's take another example, and that is addition of hypotonic fluids, hypoosmotic fluids, dilute fluids. Yes, what is going to happen now? Now, when I add dilute fluid, it will first go into the ECF. So obviously, ECF volume will increase. Remember, volume is represented horizontally. But what about the concentration of solutes in the ECF? What will happen to the osmolality in the ECF? When you're adding the dilute fluid, you're adding more water, less solutes. So overall, there is going to be a reduction in the ECF osmolality. ECF osmolality, which is 290 milliosmoles per liter, the moment you add dilute water, that means your uh, dilute solution, that means you're adding more water, this osmolality will reduce. So now the ECF osmolality has become lower than the ICF osmolality. So what is going to happen? Water now starts shifting from ECF to ICF. Until when will this shift of water happen till the ECF and the ICF osmolality is the same? Have you understood? So net result, what do I get? I get there is going to be increase in ICF volume as well, right? There is increase in ICF volume as well. Yes. There will be a reduction in the ICF osmolality, right? There is an increase in ECF volume as well. Total body water has also increased, yes? So there is an increase in the total body water, definitely because you've added fluid, so you're going to increase the total body water. You are increasing the ECF volume. ECF volume increases. Right? What has happened to the ECF volume? ECF volume increases. ECF osmolality. ECF osmolality now reduces. You've added dilute fluid, so you've reduced the ECF osmolality. Even after equilibrium has been established, ECF osmolality will be lower than normal. There is increase in the ICF volume as well. ICF volume increases, there is shift of fluid from ECF to ICF, and what will happen to ICF osmolality? This is also going to be lower. So there is increase in the total body water. There is increase in ECF volume, but a decrease in ECF osmolality. And there is an increase in ICF volume and a decrease in ICF osmolality as well. This is called hypoosmotic volume expansion. Hypoosmotic volume expansion. Right? Addition of hypotonic fluids or hypoosmotic fluids will increase and in, will result in volume expansion, but there will be lowering of the osmolality in both the ECF and the ICF. This is what happens when there is addition of hypoosmotic fluids. Let's take another example, and that is addition of hyperosmotic or hypertonic fluids. Now, when I add hypertonic fluids, again, keep those three basic principles in mind. Addition of fluid will be first in the ECF. So ECF volume will increase. But now you've added hyperosmotic fluids. Hyperosmotic, that means they're concentrated, more concentration of solutes. So what will happen to ECF osmolality? Increases. If there is an increase in ECF osmolality, I've already told you that water always moves from a dilute to a concentrated solution. ICF osmolality is lower. In other words, ICF is dilute and ECF is concentrated. 
So water moves from a dilute to a concentrated solution. Water moves from an area where water is more to an area where water is less. From a dilute to a concentrated solution. So water starts moving from ICF to ECF till the osmolality is equal on both sides. Right. So what happens is now what is what am I going to get? There will be a there will be decrease in the there is contraction of the ICF. There is going to be a decrease in ICF volume in spite of the fact that you've added fluid. Yes. In spite of the fact that there is increase in the total body water, but the ICF volume reduces. And what do I get? I get something like this. There is an increase in total body water without a doubt because you have adding fluid to the body. So there will be an expansion. There is an ECF volume will increase. ECF volume increases. There is an increase in ECF volume. There is an increase in the ECF osmolality because you've added a concentrated fluid. What will happen to ICF volume? There is a decrease in the ICF volume and an increase in ICF osmolality. Total body water has increased. The, the, the larger rectangle has definitely increased horizontally as well as vertically because there is going to be addition of hyperosmotic fluids. This is called hyperosmotic volume expansion. The key thing here is that the ICF volume, in spite of the fa fact that you've added fluid, to the body cells have shrunk. Have you understood? So there is a decrease in the ICF volume, right? Addition of you of adding fluid, but in spite of that, you've produced a shrinkage of the cells because you've added hyperosmotic or concentrated fluids. Total body water will increase. Yes, ECF volume will increase, but there is also increase in ECF osmolality. ICF volume will reduce and ICF osmolality increases. Now, this was as far as, so let's have a brief look once again at the three I told you that addition of isoosmotic fluid will cause an isoosmotic volume expansion. There will be a total body water increases, but the increase will be only towards the ECF. The ECF volume increases with no change in osmolality. ICF volume and osmolality remain unchanged. If you add hypoosmotic fluids, you're adding dilute fluids. Yes, you will increase the total body water, but at the same time, there will be shift of some, water, some of the water from ECF to ICF. So net result is increase in total body water, increase in ECF volume, but a decrease in ECF osmolality, increase in ICF volume, but a decrease in ICF osmolality. If there is addition of hyperosmotic fluids, yes, there is increase in total body water. Yes, there is increase in ECF osmolality, uh, ECF volume, but there is also an increase in ECF osmolality, which causes the cells to shrink. So in spite of the fact that we are adding water, in spite of the fact that we are increasing the total body water, cells have shrunk because the ECF osmolality is higher than the ICF osmolality. This is what happens if there is addition of hyperosmotic fluids, hyperosmotic volume expansion. Now, let's see uh, the next one, and that is loss of isoosmotic fluids, isoosmotic volume contraction. Now, a very a common example of isotonic or isoosmotic fluid loss is hemorrhage. Hemorrhage, or uh, let's say, burns, there is loss of isoosmotic fluids or initial stages of diarrhea and vomiting. Initial stages initial stages of diarrhea initial stages of diarrhea and vomiting. Initial stages of diarrhea and vomiting is isoosmotic fluid loss, but later stages it becomes a hypoosmotic fluid loss. Initial stages of diarrhea and vomiting. Right? Initially the di diarrheal fluid or the vomit, uh, vomitus is isotonic, but later it becomes hypoosmotic or hypotonic. So these are examples of isoosmotic fluid loss. That means the fluid which is being lost has got the same concentration of solutes as the ECF. And remember, fluid loss is first from the ECF. So what will happen to the ECF volume definitely reduces. But is there going to be any change in ECF osmolality? No. So ultimately, this is what you are going to get. There is a contraction. The total body water has now shrunk. But which part of the total body water has shrunk? It is the ECF volume. 
right? So there is a decrease in the total body water without a doubt. There is a decrease in the ECF volume. ECF osmolality remains the same. ECF osmolality remains the same. ICF volume and ICF osmolality, these also remain unchanged, right? So this is loss of isotonic fluids. There will be, obviously, because there is fluid loss, there will be there will be a decrease in the total body water. But remember, it is the ECF volume which reduces without any change in ECF osmolality. ICF volume and EC, uh, ICF volume and osmolality remain unchanged. This is what happens when there is loss of isoosmotic fluids or isoosmotic volume contraction. There is hemorrhage. Examples that, like, so like I said, hemorrhage, burns, initial stages of diarrhea and vomiting. Let's look at another example, and this is loss of hypoosmotic fluids. That means loss of dilute fluids, hypoosmotic volume contraction, right? Now, uh, what is the example of hypoosmotic fluid loss? Now, hypoosmotic fluid loss is, for example, excessive sweating. Excessive sweating, yes. Sweat is a hypoosmotic fluid. There is loss of water, there is loss of solutes, but more loss of water. Right? More loss of water as compared to solutes. It's a dilute fluid loss, hypoosmotic fluid loss, excessive sweating, or let's say in diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus. Diabetes, diabetes insipidus is when there is no ADH. ADH is zero. ADH, there is absolutely no, no zero ADH. Yes, ADH is zero. There is no ADH here. Yes, this is diabetes, diabetes insipidus. There is loss, there is more loss of water as compared to solutes. In fact, what happens in diabetes insipidus? Because when there is no or decreased secretion of ADHs, that there is loss of ex large volumes of extremely dilute urine. Extremely dilute urine. So what happens now is the ECF volume will definitely reduce, but what about the ECF osmolality? Now, like I said, there is a loss of more loss of water, less loss of solute. So what will happen to ECF osmolality? ECF osmolality, in fact, increases, right? ECF osmolality now increases. There is more loss of water, less loss of solutes. So the concentration of solutes in the ECF will now increase. And if there is increased the concentration of solutes, water will start moving from ICF to ECF. So the ICF volume will also reduce. And this shift of water from ICF to ECF will happen till the ECF and the ICF osmolality is the same. So net result is something like this. Have you seen this? This dashed line is the new total body water. There is a decrease in the total body water. There is a decrease in the ECF volume. There is an increase in ECF osmolality. And there is a decrease in ICF volume, but there is also an increase in ICF osmolality. Remember, it is water which is shifting, not solutes. I've understood. So when, the, when there is more loss of fluid, less loss of water from the ECF, the ECF osmolality rises. ECF becomes more concentrated. So water starts shifting from ICF to ECF. And this shift will happen till the ECF and the ICF osmolality is the same. So there is going to be a decrease in total body water because there is loss of water from the body. But what is so there is reduction now in both ECF and ICF volumes, and but there is increase in the ECF and ICF osmolality. And this is known as a hyperosmotic hyperosmotic dehydration right please remember loss of hypoosmotic fluid will cause a hyperosmotic dehydration there is loss of water so it's a dehydration but the dehydration is now the the, the, the net result the result of loss of dilute fluids is a hyperosmotic dehydration hypo loss of hypoosmotic fluids or hypoosmotic volume contraction will produce a hyperosmotic dehydration. It results in it results in a hyperosmotic dehydration. It results in a hyperosmotic dehydration. This is what happens when there is loss of hypoosmotic fluids. 
Let's see another example, and that is loss of hyperosmotic fluids. What is loss of hyperosmotic fluids now? What are the examples of loss of hyperosmotic fluids? Loss of hyperosmotic fluids, for example, Addison's disease. Addison's. Now, in Addison's disease, there is a mineralocorticoid deficiency. Mineralocorticoid deficiency. So there is going to be now loss of solutes in urine. Yes, mineralocorticoids are absorbed, involved in reabsorption of the sodium. So there is going to be loss of a concentrated urine. Yes. So what will happen in Addison's? There is definitely going to be decrease in total body water. There is a decrease in ECF volume, without a doubt. But what will happen to ECF osmolality? It reduces because there is more loss of solutes as compared to water. Yes. So water starts shifting from ECF to ICF till the ECF and ICF osmolality is the same. So what is happening to ICF here? ICF volume will increase. Osmolality on both sides has reduced. This is the net result. There is a decrease in total body water. So the, so the horizontally, the rectangle will definitely, the large rectangle will definitely become smaller. There is a decrease in ECF volume. There is also a decrease in ECF osmolality. There is an increase in ICF volume and a decrease in ICF osmolality. But please understand the net result is definitely a decrease in total body water. There is going to be a dehydration. So loss of hyperosmotic fluids or a hyperosmotic volume contraction will result in, it results in a hypoosmotic, hypoosmotic dehydration. The total body water in the body will definitely reduce so there is a dehydration and the osmolality will also decrease there is reduction in total body water there is a decrease in the osmolality so this is called a hypoosmotic dehydration i we clear that so this is what is going to happen in addison's mineralocorticoid deficiency there is decrease in ecf volume decrease in ecf osmolality increase in icf volume in decrease in icf osmolality so this is what happens. Now, have a look at this again. What happens if there is loss of fluid? If there is loss of isoosmotic fluids, like for instance, I told you in hemorrhage, in burns, in initial stages of diarrhea and vomiting, there is going to be a uh, decrease in total body water. Yes, there is decrease in ECF volume. ECF osmolality remains unchanged because it is isoosmotic. So this is producing an isoosmotic dehydration. So loss of uh, isoosmotic fluid results in isoosmotic dehydration, right? There is a decrease in total body water, but there is no change in osmolality, so it's isoosmotic dehydration. Then I told you what happens if there's loss of hypoosmotic fluids, like for instance, I said excessive sweating or diabetes insipidus or later stages of diarrhea and vomiting. Loss of hypoosmotic fluids means dilute fluids, more loss of water as compared to loss of solutes. This will result in decrease in total body water. Yes, there is going to be decrease in ECF volume, but what will happen to the ECF osmolality rises. ICF volume also decreases, but the ICF osmolality rises. In other words, this is resulting in a hyperosmotic dehydration. Yes, there is a dehydration, there is shrinkage of total body water, but the osmolality has increased. So it's hyperosmotic dehydration. What happens when there is loss of hyperosmotic fluids, for example, in Addison's mineralocorticoid deficiency? This will result in decrease in total body water, but this now results in a hypoosmotic dehydration. There is going to be decrease in uh, there is going to be decrease in the total body water. There will be decrease in the osmolality on uh, both sides. So this will result in a hypoosmotic dehydration. Right. So let us see if you get a question on uh, uh, on the Daroyanid diagram. So you can get a, simply a diagram and ask to identify. Now, the first thing that you have to see is, is there an increase in the total body water? Or is there a decrease in the total body water? Yes. Once you see if there is an increase in total body water, yes, so now is it an isoosmotic volume expansion? That means no change in osmolality, right? 
isoosmotic volume expansion that means there is going to be increase in the ecf volume ecf osmolality is unchanged ecf osmolality remains the same right so this is isoosmotic volume expansion increase in total body water yes or is it a hypoosmotic volume expansion that means the um uh, the total body water has increased but the osmolality has reduced that means osmolality has reduced on both sides ecf and icf that means there has been addition of dilute fluids hypotonic fluids addition of isotonic isoosmotic fluids will produce an isoosmotic volume expansion addition of dilute fluids will produce a hypoosmotic volume expansion total body water will increase but the osmolality on both sides will reduce is it a hyperosmotic volume expansion now hyperosmotic means now total body water has increased but now because there is an increase in the ecf osmolality icf shrinks icf volume reduces but the point is total body water has increased osmolality on both sides is higher so that means addition of hyperosmotic or hypertonic fluids right so this is what happens so first thing that you have to identify whenever you get a question is what is there an increase in total body water or is there a decrease in the total body water increase then look at it look see is it isoosmotic is it hypoosmotic is it hyperosmotic if it's isoosmotic volume expansion addition of isotonic fluids hypoosmotic volume expansion addition of dilute fluids hyperosmotic volume expansion that means addition of uh, uh, hyperosmotic or hypertonic fluids. Now, what happens if there is a loss of total body water, if there is a decrease in total body water? Now, again, check firstly, see horizontally what has happened to the rectangle. Has it decreased? That means it is a loss of total body water. Then look at the osmolality. So, if it is a, uh, if it's an isoosmotic dehydration, Isoosmotic dehydration. Isoosmotic dehydration means the total body water shrinks with no change in osmolality. Here it will be the ECF volume only which will reduce, not the ICF. So in that case, this would be loss of hypotonic fluids like hemorrhage, like burns. These are the ones which will produce isoosmotic dehydration. Decrease in total body water producing a hypoosmotic dehydration. Or first, let's see hyperosmotic dehydration. Hyperosmotic dehydration means now what has happened is in spite of the, there is decrease in total body water, but the osmolality has increased. That is that means there has been loss of hypotonic fluids, loss of hypotonic fluids. Like I told you, excessive sweating, diabetes insipidus. This will result in if there is more loss of water as loss of solutes, it will be a hyperosmotic dehydration. And number three, you can have a hypoosmotic dehydration. That means uh, this, this means that total body water has reduced, but there is decrease in osmolality. That means it is a loss of hypertonic fluids hypertonic fluids right so this is uh, this is how you will approach any sort of a graphical question or any sort of a diagrammatic question on the darrow yanet diagram and you should be able to answer that yes you should be able to answer uh, what is the um, uh, what happens when there is now there is a catch question here and that cast catch question is addition of 5% dextrose Yes, 5% dextrose. Now, as far as 5% dextrose is concerned, this is isoosmotic. But the problem is, dextrose will be metabolized. Yes, or 5% glucose or 5% dextrose. Dextrose will be metabolized. This is isoosmotic to begin with, but then it becomes hypoosmotic. It becomes a dilute solution. So when the question says 5% dextrose, then please answer it for addition of hypoosmotic fluid. And we've already discussed what will happen if there is addition of hypoosmotic fluid, dilute fluid. There will be, like I told you, total body water increases, but the osmolality on both sides will reduce. Yes. 
this is as far as uh, the the Yannick diagram is concerned. Uh, we will have more and more of such discussions as we go along. This was just a demo trying to tell you how we are going to coordinate physiology with the clinical aspects, right? So this is uh, this is just a preview of what physiology is all about. And um, I am Dr. Anupama Chaudhary Devgan. If you are applying to our courses, you can use uh, a referral code DRANMED974 for a 10% discount. Yes. Uh, if there are any questions, I can take them up. I can take up your questions in case there are any.